Oh, it is so cold here. I think my cat goes in denial. He sticks his face in his favorite fluffy and he just like ignores outside. <laughs> like, Lenny, what are you doing? This is where I want to be. This is where I'm gonna be in a few months, Cuba, doing a kitty cat and uh, dog rescue down there. This is frigid where I am right now. Um, I was finding a table for my coffee and uh, <laughs> on that table was this little note I got this morning. I don't know if you can read this. Um, Madeline loves cats. This is my uh, seven-year-old daughter and she says, cats are very, very cute. Cats are very, very fluffy. <laughs> it's awesome and it goes on and on. I am going to get her to read this whole entire note that she was making to practice her printing while um, talking about something she enjoys. And she comes out with me to Cuba as well, the whole family does, and we have a good time. Um, so Q&A, Q&A is gonna happen by video as often as I can do it this year. Um, uh, last year I got into the habit of just doing it by email, so as an individual you'd get a message back from me. I guess the thing is others don't get to share in uh, what your story is, uh, what's going on with your cat, some advice towards that. Um, it's great for other people to see that, so I'm gonna start doing videos this year, so. 2019 Q&A, this is it. Okay, ask your questions 250 words or less. I don't know why I have 250 words there. I think I've maybe had one question, 250 words. Um, yeah, I think I'm gonna take that away this year. It's, it's, it's not sufficient, isn't it, to actually get across what's going on, so. I'll change, I'll change that text. I'm glad everyone ignored that because I would ignore it too. Um, I've got a 15 year old cat, Jermaine, who has diabetes, CKD, takes sub-Q fluids twice a week, has dental disease, having two teeth being pulled today, and now possibly has intestinal lymphoma or IBD, inflammatory bowel disease. This 15 year old beautiful cat um, has a, what I call like a triple threat. You've got three things going on and that you've got to figure out what exactly to do, what's relevant, uh, how you approach things, what keeps Jermaine happy, what keeps you happy. All the, so we're gonna get into that. Jermaine's not alone, a lot of cats just like that. Um, she's been having issues with vomiting since she was 10 after a bout of pancreatitis. Our vet would like to do a biopsy to test if her, to test to see if her thickened intestinal wall is cancer or IBD. I'm worried that the risks may outweigh the benefits for her for treatment uh, at her age. Any trips to the vet causes so much anxiety that she develops diarrhea after any visit, even if it's just a checkup, which has which has required follow-up treatment every time. Uh, that is not fun. Uh, while I don't want Jermaine to suffer, I feel like the visits to the vet take longer for her to recover in the last three years. In order to diagnose, she will require surgery for a biopsy, a follow-up visit 10 days later to have stitches removed, and then, depending on the results, frequent visits for blood tests and to have medications administered. I'm worried all the vet visits could have a negative effect on her quality of life due to anxiety, diarrhea, and the side effects of whatever medications she's going to be taking. I also don't want our veterinarian to think I'm an awful person or to be totally frustrated with me if I choose not to have the biopsy done. Have you experienced anything similar as a doctor or an owner, what were the options that can be taken? Thank you so much for your input, Holly. Let's break this down. Let's go back to the beginning. Um, Holly doesn't want Jermaine to suffer, but is definitely concerned about, you know what, what do I do with this whole situation? What do I do with all these tests? What do I do with um, what I find out, what that means for my cat, giving her behavior or feelings during a car ride, during a vet visit, it obviously bothers her to the point of a stress diarrhea. So what do we do? There is a question, a single question that you can ask when you're trying to figure out what to do for your cat. Those of you who have done the scratch pad with me, that's a one-on-one -on -one longer, more in-depth consultation. Um, there's a phrase that I say, and it's really important to figure out how do you sort out all these things? And that's this, you ask yourself, who do I need to be today? So you will accept me. Who do you need to be? Who is the person that you need to be so your cat will accept you? When an illness happens in your cat's life, you are on a journey. Sometimes you don't know where you're going to be next month, next year. Sometimes you don't know by taking certain actions, certain directions, where that's going to bring you. So when you're on a journey, the number one thing that you can do that you can look back on and feel good about 
is to always respect the relationship. Whatever that relationship is between you and your cat, whatever that is, it's different for different people. And as you go through the choices that you need to make, always look back, look at your cat. I look down right now because that's where mine is sitting right now, staring at me. Who do I need to be to be the person that he always picks first? What decision course can I make to preserve the relationship? That's really important. Sometimes this means you are a person who brings in tough love to the relationship. I know the destination is good for both of us, so we have to get through a few speed bumps to get there. It's not gonna be pleasant, but the end of that journey for both of us is worth it. That's gonna be different. Whatever that looks like will be different for every cat, person, and, and veterinarian who's, who's involved. Um, now sometimes it's not that. Sometimes it's more about reflecting back on, this is where we are, this is our life together, there are things in our life that make, it, that make this relationship work. Certain treatment or opportunities I can do to try to make things better rob that relationship from us. That's a different type of decision that's involved there. So who do you need to be for your cat to pick you? Is it tough love? Is it instead a reflection on here's the relationship, here's our life right now, this is good enough? Kind of like that Jack Nicholson movie, uh, as good as it, what is that called? As good as it gets? or it's somewhere in the middle. That's a discussion, that's a reflection, okay? All right, let's come back to something a bit more technical, IBD versus cancer. IBD stands for inflammatory bowel disease. It's inflammation within the gut, often the small intestine, that can result in weight loss, that can result in vomiting, it's, um, that can irritate your pancreas, so you've got flare-ups of pancreatitis. And um, it can be something that's relatively simple to manage. Sometimes it's just specific foods that your cat um, might want to eat that could help out that situation, but sometimes it's very complex. So what about IBD and cancer? What about that biopsy? Would you do the biopsy? Well, I can tell you this, and this is true not just for biopsy, but for any single test you would do for your cat. And that is, for me, other than wellness testing where I, you know, I might do that on an annual basis, I'm confirming certain things about kidneys, diet, what have you. Other than that, if I have an ill pet and I'm doing some diagnostics, the diagnostics have to have a purpose. And that purpose needs to give you a crossroads, a change of plan. If I don't do that diagnostic, I end up here instead of here. If I do do that diagnostic, that blood test, that biopsy, whatever, that x-ray, whatever, it changes absolutely what I'm gonna do for my pet. Otherwise, it's pretty academic, which is fine if your cat's easy to take diag to do diagnostics with and you want certain sort of, and you want certain information. But with a cat going through an illness, it's really important to have a discussion to figure out what exactly does this do for us. The reason for that is this. Where that information goes to, at that point in time, you gotta look forward and say, this is what I found out, Am I willing to do that treatment based on what that test told me? Or even if I get there, am I not willing to do that? Is it, is it pushing beyond where my relationship needs to go for this particular cat, for my cat? So in the case of the biopsy, it's this. IBD and cancer, there is a relationship. One thing can look like the other. It can be difficult to tease apart. It can be difficult to make recommendations because they can mimic each other. One's obviously worse than the other in most cases. And so, so if you know that to treat my cat's gut, I'm willing to use this medication, this medication, this approach with food, this approach with, this approach with supplements. And that's what I'm prepared to do. Do you need the biopsy to tell you that? No, you don't. But if down the road looks like I did get a diagnosis back of lymphoma, gut cancer, and I think I want to go figure out my options past that. Should I see an oncologist? What more can they do for me? then a gut biopsy does make sense because you now have some solid evidence to say, I should do that. It's worth my time and my cat's time and that's important for this relationship. There is one big thing. Before I recommend a biopsy, I'm very careful to tell them this one thing and that is a biopsy isn't a black and white decision-making process. A biopsy sometimes does not give you a black and white result. What I mean by that is, and I've seen it happen, you take a biopsy, you get back inflammation, 
but inflammation can be secondary to cancer, but you actually didn't see the cancer cells. Um, uh, or, or in the reading, there's not enough information or, enough, or not enough change in the cells to suggest that that's the problem for sure. So, some, so sometimes you don't get those answers. You go through it, you don't get those answers, you're back where you started. You're back with, am I trying these medications sort of thing. You're back with, am I sticking to the approach I already have. So that's the thing about biopsies, okay? I'm not saying to do it, not saying not to do it. What I'm saying is think about the next step that follows it. If that next step is something that is a fork in the road that is, and that's a path that you want to take, it becomes more likely, it becomes more justified to do it. If, if you get to that crossroads and you don't want to take, and you don't want to take either paths, that would suggest that you can think about biopsy in your cat in a different way. Okay, uh, last two things I want to address. Uh, the stress of vet visits, and uh, it sounds like you have a good relationship with your vet because you're concerned about what, what your veterinarian thinks about you. Um, uh, I have relationships with clients like that where we're actually concerned about each other, about how each other's feel as we move, as we move forward with our, our, our pets that we have. A shared responsibility with. Um, that's a cool relationship to have with someone actually. It's, it's, it's really good. So, so what about a um, uh, trip to the vet and the vet itself? Well, I'll actually start with a trip to the trip to the vet. Yes, it can be stressful for many, many cats. Um, you can have a cat where training them to a uh, to their um, carrier, um, it's not working, it's not practical or relevant for you. But when I was working in a physical practice, um, for some cats we would uh, send home sedation. Like they would never come in raw. What I mean by raw is a cat who is in a sensory place where they're allowed to feel everything. The bumps, literally the bumps in the road while they're in their carrier. The sounds of the waiting room, the smells of the waiting room. Everything in that path of going to the clinic going through that with nothing to help you out that's going in raw so very often your veterinarian can prescribe some very safe we're not talking tranquilizers we're talking very safe things to tone that down allow them to not be raw uh, on their visit to the hospital and um, uh, make them feel better sometimes reduce that stress enough so that when they're actually there you don't end up with a stress diarrhea you don't it, it's less of an ordeal so your kitty, definitely, that's a discussion that should happen. Um, so I'm a mobile vet, we go to people's homes, and let me tell you, the approach we can do when enough time and respect is given to that individual into their own home, it's amazing. It's amazing the uh, um, what some cats will volunteer to do for you in their own home, whereas they have a harder time dealing with it uh, in the clinic. So it, it's pretty amazing. Uh, now, what about your vet's feelings? How your vet feels? So as a vet, we are trained to give the gold standard recommendation first. What is gold standard? It's kind of a bad name. Gold sounds expensive. Um, you know, that's a sensitive area of sensitivity. I get that. Uh, gold standard, what that means is you're giving the best recommendation. You're giving the top number one evidence-based scientific uh, uh, recommendation first, or at least it's prominent in the discussion. So why would we make these gold standard recommendations? Um, it, it's, it's two reasons. The first reason is you, you're concerned. As a veterinarian, you're concerned. You want to see the best happen for this particular kitty cat and this person. So you're offering you know, the most up-to-date, evidence-based recommendation. It's called the gold standard recommendation, basically. But what's the other reason why we do it? The other reason why we do it, and vets, correct me, any vets watching this, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is part of it. The other reason you're doing that is you're doing it to, as a vet, to protect yourself. And the reason you're doing that to protect yourself is all of us vets, you know, work long enough and you will meet an individual, a person, you'll meet a person where for whatever else is going on in their lives, what you said or what you didn't said uh, kind of paints a target on your back. And and so the typical vet protection thing is I'm giving, going to list out every single thing. It's up to you to make a decision. And I'm giving you that ultimate gold standard because I don't want, if I don't make that recommendation, whether, whether I think you can afford it or not, I'm gonna make that recommendation and it's, it, it's protective. I wrote it in my file. And that means, you know, if you decide not to do it and then your cat doesn't do very well, it's difficult for you to come back and then blame me or make a complaint about me to my licensing body or do this or do that or, or worse. All to say, and you've decided this isn't for me because it's not the right choice. There's an alternative that you'd like to pursue, um, but you want to preserve that relationship and you think having that dialogue is important with your vet. You could just, you could simply say, I thought about it and 
it is okay. I am opting to do this. I understand that I could do this and I'm opting to do this. And, and just a simple sentence like that, that acknowledge that you've consciously made a decision and you know that there are others, will go far just to keep that relationship the way that it needs to be. And, and any vet who re understands relationships would not feel that you're making the wrong decision, that you are a bad person. Instead, what they should say is, thank you for letting me know, I'm here for you. No matter what happens from here on out, I respect your decision and I'm here for you. I'm here to support you. I'm here to support your cat. I'm here to support that relationship. Let's move forward together. That's the way it should go. Thanks, Holly. Thanks for taking care of that kitty.